The very early history of Earth, and indeed life on this world, is still largely shrouded in mystery. One of the biggest and most glaring mysteries is how Earth maintained liquid water, as evidence shows that it did when the sun shouldn't have been luminous enough to sustain that. This is known as the faint young sun paradox, and while there are some potential resolutions out there, it's still not yet clear just what happened during this period that kept Earth warm. The paradox hinges on an astrophysical fact. Stars like the sun increase in luminosity as they age due to the changing ratios of hydrogen and helium in their cores. This process will eventually be what causes the extinction of all life on Earth, and indeed it's thought that this process is the only thing that can completely snuff out life on this world at the microbial level. For the microbes, things like the extinction of the dinosaurs by an asteroid were blips, or even an opportunity to eat well on dinosaur corpses. But with the brightening sun, they cannot escape, and few things are more sure to cause extinction than the slow boiling of this planet. Though your star system getting irradiated by the accretion disk of a passing black hole until finally being torn apart and spaghettified before falling into oblivion is a pretty solid one as well. But in its younger days, the sun was very different. The sun's output was only about 70% of what it is today. This means that earlier in the solar system's history, Earth should have been frozen over. Yet this does not appear to have done so, at least that early. This is known as the Young Faint Sun Paradox, and it's backed up in the geological record in that it shows it was warm here, with evidence of liquid water going back as early as 3.8 billion years ago, and probably further, but with no obvious mechanism as to how that came to be. And to deepen the mystery, there are periods where it actually did get quite cold, such as the Huronian Glaciation. The Huronian Glaciation is a very ancient extinction event that not much is known about, though we've known something happened since studies of deposits in 1907 showed that between 2.2 and 2.5 billion years ago, increased tectonic activity resulted in more carbon dioxide being sequestered, reducing the greenhouse effect of that gas, causing catastrophic global cooling. This is interesting because before this event, most microbes were anaerobic, but coincident with this time, cyanobacteria evolved, ushering in the age of photosynthesis. This is where our oxygen source appeared, but it was catastrophic for the anaerobic bacteria in that oxygen was poisonous, leading to a mass extinction of bacteria that couldn't handle the new conditions. But this only happened after the planet rusted. An oxygen sink was created initially because metallic iron, which was abundant in those days, iron meteorites and things falling everywhere, reacted with the oxygen to form rusty compounds. But when all the iron rusted, then the oxygen began to accumulate and form the end of the anaerobes in the new atmosphere of Earth, and the beginnings of what would become the trees and lovely shrubs and flowers and things that we have in our yards. But the anaerobes are still around. They just live in specialized anoxic environments on Earth, such as deep in the anoxic Black Sea, or underground. But ultimately, this glaciation was a rough one, and photosynthetic Earth life is thought to have almost committed suicide, as Earth seems to have almost completely, or completely, froze over, almost stopping photosynthesis. Somehow it survived, but it almost didn't. This creates a scenario where this is a potential great filter, because of how situational it is, could it be that habitable exoplanets remain domains of methanogenic, primitive bacteria that can survive almost anything, but when photosynthesis arises in alien analogs of cyanobacteria, they more often than not commit suicide, and the status quo at some point favors the primitive life forms again? Or is the reality such that most exoplanets where life arises simply sail past this, through the tenacity of microbial life like Earth did? Open question. So what caused the variance in temperatures? And what happened when life arose under these conditions 3.5 billion years ago? And the Huronian glaciation wasn't the only one. Extreme ice ages seem to have been the rule at one point in Earth's history, evidenced by what appear to be glacial deposits in areas that would have been near the equator at the time. This snowball Earth hypothesis may have been a situation where Earth seesawed between its surface nearly or fully freezing over 
then the equilibrium changed and it thawed, and then back to freezing again. This planet may once have been something like Europa, as opposed to the Earth we know today. But as to what warmed the planet during the faint young sun period, the key here may be greenhouse gases. One possibility is ammonia, but this suffers from a problem of its own. It's a greenhouse gas, but it's also readily broken down by sunlight. It was then suggested that hazy conditions might have altered the equation, but that too was shown to not be possible. So then there is carbon dioxide. This one is a better option because there does seem to have been a mechanism for creating it, but you need a lot of it to produce the needed effect, about a thousand times higher than the levels we have right now. But that does seem to be possible with what we know of Earth's carbon cycle that early in the planet's history, and remains the most likely explanation, though there may have been other factors that allowed for fluctuations, such as the rise of microbial life adding methane into the atmosphere. But there are some other ideas about what might have happened. Another is that the greenhouse effect was helped by a stronger solar wind that protected Earth from cosmic rays. Cosmic rays have, at times, been more abundant, and are thought to have the effect of cooling planets like Earth by affecting an increasing low-level cloud formation. The whether this could happen enough to have an effect is debated, but there is some evidence for a more active sun early on, found in meteorite studies. Another explanation that has been advanced is mass loss from the sun. It goes that the fainter, younger sun produced stronger solar winds, those winds would have caused the sun to lose mass, as it does now, but to a much greater degree. The idea is that the sun has lost as much as 10% of its original mass, which a more massive sun would mean that its output early on was significantly greater, keeping the planet from freezing. This would have had to keep going for about a billion years before the solar wind weakened. This is not borne out by meteorite studies, however, which show only a short period of increased solar wind, and indeed studies of a young sun-like star matches the meteorites in its decline in stellar wind output, so this explanation does not seem likely to resolve the paradox. And, oddly enough, other planets in the solar system add to the mystery of the faint young sun paradox. Mars once had liquid water, so how did a fainter sun manage to produce a warm, wet planet further out in the solar system, suggesting that its output was very strong indeed, or Mars had something unusual going on as well in regards to climate. Venus, on the other hand, should have been favored early on by being closer to the faint young sun. It would have had a comfortable Earth-like climate, complete with liquid water. Indications are that it may well have been like that. So the faint young sun paradox remains unresolved. But within this, there is another question. How did Earth get its water in the first place? The traditional view is that Earth got it through comets and asteroids depositing it on its surface, along with Mars and Venus both likely seeing the same process. This would transport water from the icy outer solar system into the comparatively dry inner solar system. But this possibility has recently been called into question. Now on the table is that Earth had its water from the very start. This comes from studying a type of meteorite known as an instatite chondrite. These are thought to be the predominant material that Proto-Earth formed from. It's recently been measured that instatite chondrites are very high in hydrogen, which means hydrogen released from them during the formation of the Earth would combine with oxygen to make water. It's been found also that Earth's mantle contains a similar ratio of hydrogen as the instatite chondrites. So it's possible that Earth's water was always here. But the way to finally solve that mystery is to get some ice samples from the outer solar system and look for differences or similarities between the water in them, say levels of things like deuterium, and compare them to Earth's water. If they match, then our water came from the outer solar system and you're drinking some comets or perhaps a dead Pluto or two. If they don't match, then Earth was born with its water, which is good news for life in the universe. For an exoplanet to acquire water, it would need to have undergone a similar process of bombardment sometime in its history. There's no guarantee of that, so that might mean that water planets are actually rare overall, lowering the chances of life arising. But if they aren't dependent on that, 
then worlds born with water suddenly give life significantly better chances of arising on worlds within the habitable zones of stars. Thanks for listening. I'm science fiction author and futurist John Michael Godier, currently wondering how old our water is. 4.6 billion years or less? I'd really like to know so I can tell it happy birthday each year since it really is the most important, useful item on this planet other than the planet itself. Anyway, shout out to the water, total liquid winner, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.